What's good, everybody? Indrid here, bringing you a, another episode of Behind the Avatar. I am so lucky to be joined by Joseph in the flesh, Meacham. I really appreciate you joining. Joseph has a history in broadcasting, um, doing some shoutcasting with um, Battle Right, which is a game that I was very involved in. If any of you follow my YouTube, you'll notice that there's a lot of content on there. So I'm excited to have him because I really love that game. We definitely have some shared experience there. And like our first guest, Joseph also works for Wisdom Media as a live director. So I'm really excited to learn more about what a live director is and how did he get there. Welcome, Joseph. Hey, thanks for having me on, man. I'm really excited. No, no, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, so those of you who are new, what we're going to try to do is basically just talk about somebody's story of how they got to work in the video game industry or esport industry. There's a lot of overlap there. So, yes. Joseph, how did that start out for you? What was your very first, like, esport video game type gig, paid or unpaid? Um, it's hard to say. I was big into streaming Yoshi's Island as a speedrunner back in 2013. Oh, and I did. A, I know that because of Trihex. I've seen him every now and then. Yeah, I was a. Uh, I knew Trihex, and I was adjacent to him. You might say you're a contemporary. Um, yes, something like that. Cool. <laughs> So I did a couple speed runs for some different um, charity streams and stuff like that. But like my AGDQ, first, that kind of stuff? Nothing to that size, but okay. yeah, along the same lines. Cool. Uh, I wasn't quite as good as Trihex. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, my first paid gig came in 2016, um, and that was playing Battle Right, actually. I was part of a team with my good friend who goes by the tag Vorim, and we consistently placed pretty highly in tournaments and started making a little bit of money that way so when you talk about tournaments i know often like some intro level tournaments would be like esl or something like that do you remember what type of tournaments those were uh yeah it was esl and then also a tournament series ran by the production team rivals oh okay cool and so you, you talked about streaming in the beginning what was that like for you that was a lot of fun. Uh, it came about because I was working graveyard shifts out of high school, and mm. I needed something to do when I wasn't working. I'm not somebody that wants to like destroy their sleep schedule every time they have a weekend, so I just decided that I needed to find a hobby to take up those like 12 hours when I'm the only one in the house awake. So I would stream Yoshi's Island. Okay. And how was that for you? Because I've been doing a lot of research recently about uh, specifically Twitch and then streaming in general and like discoverability and and different things along those lines uh, how was yes. the success for you uh, i had pretty decent success i would average anywhere from 40 to 100 viewers that's awesome um, it's interesting that you note accessibility and like being found on twitch because that's also something i spent a lot of time thinking about like how did people find me back then i think speed running fills a very specific niche that mm. If people like a game, they're going to go and look for that game. And if you just so happen to speed run it, like it, if people have nostalgia for Yoshi's Island, they're just going to watch my stream, right? Um, so yep. it's a bit off topic, but it's interesting. I think that speedrunners have a little bit of an easier time gaining traction than a variety streamer. Interesting. Yeah, I, um, I, I really like the speedrun community. Like I watch AGDQ a little bit when I can. Um, there's this great YouTube channel called Summoning Salt. I think is what it's called. Oh, dude, yeah. Um, and he does a lot of different stuff for like capturing how the 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 speeds are getting faster and like why and like different tricks that are found. And um, yeah, I I don't know. I have this weird fascination with speed running. I've never speed ran. I don't I don't have the personality for it, but I like watching it for sure. sure. Yeah, I really love summoning Salt's videos. The way he just and it breaks down the different times that people get in their speed run and how it happens is just so fun to watch big fan yeah i can't imagine uh how much time he spends in like research and stuff for his videos it's it's crazy yeah i can barely like sit down and research for like 30 minutes straight let alone the endless amount of hours he must have to put into it <laughs> yeah uh if anybody out there is listening definitely check out his videos he is awesome absolutely awesome i i think every video he puts out is a absolute dynamite even games i don't care about yeah, same. He makes me care about Wii Golf, and I never thought I just that watched that thing. one. It was so good. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny the way that a good storyteller can just get you engulfed in any kind of story. 
it's so funny because um gilly who was my my first guest on here um talked about we talked about the same thing is storytelling and so yes. i don't know if this is a good segue or not but tell me a little bit about uh how storytelling you think has affected your success in in the video game slash esports sphere you know it's funny i don't think i would be here at all if it weren't for storytelling okay. i didn't even perceive it as such back in the day but when i was commentating battle right most of my value was just in the fact that I had been in the scene since the game had started. Mm -hmm. So I just knew all of these players. I could tell stories about who used to team with who and why this match was cool because it's two ex teammates going against each other. Yeah. Um, and it's funny. I think storytelling is something that people don't recognize they're doing, but it's so interwoven into all the different aspects of like our conversations and stuff like that. And yeah, it's absolutely an integral part, especially if you're going to want to cast. Yeah, I was talking with um, Josh Burry, was my uh, previous mm. guest, and he writes for uh, the Score Esports, and he was talking a lot about story, and uh, it's something that I never really developed. I felt like I was a pretty strict play-by-play -play in, the, in the beginning, got into analytics a little bit, and uh, at the end of my time doing some shout casting, I was really like, oh, it's more about the story. Like, I got to do a better job of this. But then I haven't yeah. done it since. So, yeah, it's it's interesting how that works. I think most people that are commentators want to come in and be the play by play, the guy that speaks quickly and wows the chat. But it's really the storyteller that drives the narrative of the events and really makes the event more than what it is. I 100 percent agree with you. I, I've talked at length about. Um, and this this is definitely going to touch, I, I think, a little bit with what you're doing now is um, like League of Legends is a I think, you know, it's one of the most popular games, probably the most popular game. Right. I think still today. But I feel like it's never going to adapt to the masses because hmm. the story of the like sport, I'll call it the sport right now, it, it, it cannot be communicated to people who don't play the game. And so, like, when you think about, like, baseball, football, um, in soccer, a little less unless you're talking globally. But, like, even in America, I don't feel like people understand the story of a soccer game. But we get right. a football game. We get a baseball game. We get a basketball game. And so even if I don't play it, I don't really follow it. Like, I can sit down and watch it. Sure. It's it's interesting because I think a lot of that breaks down to expo exposure. Like we've oh, been yeah. expo exposed in America to football for so many, so many years. Yeah. So we can just kind of sit down and pick up on what teams are doing and what is cool about these teams. Like if you sit down and watch a team with a killer quarterback and a great receiving core, you just, you know, you see them pass the ball and catch like eight plays in a row and get a touchdown. And you're like, okay, so that's the story for this team. They're really good at passing. Right. And it's interesting. I wonder if League of Legends will ever get to that point where it's exposed enough to where there's never a confusion by the masses when they see it and they recognize, oh, this team's map control is insane. Or, oh, this team has a star player that just destroys everybody. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, and obviously the longer the game sticks around, the more likely that is to happen. But I feel right. like gamers in general are very fickle. And so how do you get to the point where that game has been around long enough that generations of people understand that knowledge. Yeah. It's, I have no idea whether or not league of legends will still exist in like 40 years, but that's one question I wish I had the answer to. I wonder <laughs> if people are going to get tired of it or, and they're going to want the next game or if it's going to turn into like a baseball that people just like it and it never needs to go away. Right. Yeah. It's a great question. Um, so we talked uh, briefly about, um, your your time coming up with streaming and your connection with with streaming, what was the was the next big step? I think you said was with the battle right. Yes, the the next big step was going from being a battle right competitive player to being a commentator. And if I'm not mistaken, they had a full studio and everything that you were working in. Yes, um, the battle right pro league did have a studio in Burbank, California. Pretty nice place. So could you? tell somebody who's thinking about you know they're really involved in a the game they're like man i would really love to be able to get in and, and do some type of production work at a studio or something like that like what was the process for you how did you apply how did you get noticed etc right it, it sounds kind of generic to at least it feels generic to say it um but whenever i'm asked this the main thing i respond to people with is it's all about networking mm. 
I think I had a bit of an easier time getting in because I was my my name was known by the commentators and by the company that was running the events. Mm -hmm. So I had more exposure in that way. Um, but I got there because after each tournament, I would reach out to the tournament organizer and be like, thank you for putting this on. I had a blast. We love your events. And after a while, I started to build a rapport with them and we would talk personally through Discord messages and stuff like that. And I just let them know, hey, if you guys ever need a caster, I have a background in speech. I'd love to get in on it. So it's really just about finding the people that are important in the either tournament or the events or the gaming company you're trying to work for and build a rapport with them. Uh, Josh Burry talked a little bit about this. I don't know if you caught his interview at all, uh, not expecting you to, but it was he <laughs> talked about uh, one of the things that he does is he likes to uh, go on like Twitter or something like that, find a company. So like we'll just say – um, like was the media, like it was the media's Twitter and then see everyone they follow and then follow those people. So you can get to the people who do things. And, and so that was a really cool idea that I liked, but uh, I would love to hear what were the steps that you went through to be able to find those people that were like the influencers or the people that you needed to connect with. For me, it was literally just the people commentating the events. Okay. Back in the day, the Battle Right tournaments were hosted largely by casters by the name of Findable Carpet and Rainiest Day. Um, huge fan of both of them, by the way. Immensely talented people. Not even just in commentating alone, but as part of a business, those two are geniuses. Mm. Um, but I reached out to them specifically through uh, Discord DMs eventually, but primarily through Twitch chat, funny enough. Mm. So was that would that be while they were commentating or like their own personal Twitch chats that you were using? Oh, right. Yeah, I guess that's an important distinction. It was almost always after tournaments. They would like pop in occasionally to like either say what the chat is saying about them or to say hi. And I would always just say, hey, I really enjoyed your cast. You did great. Thank you for the tournament. That's I, where that started. Twitch chat. I love that you basically uh, killed them with kindness. And that's how you got into <laughs> a position of being there because... I, I feel like I, I don't know like I I my tagline when I used to stream and stuff was the most positive place in gaming. Oh, I get down with that. And so I, I just feel like there's a, always a lot of negativity, like a lot of rage, a lot of tilt associated with gaming. And so I love hearing that you just like straight out positivity to everybody. Yeah, I want to be people's friends. Yeah, I love that. that. That's like as simple as it is in my mind. It's like I want <laughs> I want to like people and I want people to like me. I want to build relationships that help everybody grow yeah i am so down with that i like that a lot um so after your time with battle right did you jump right into where you're at now with um uh wisdom media my time after battle right was very hectic so the battle right lan and pro league season three got essentially canceled so i had to find a new paycheck pretty much mm-hmm um, so I can't say too much about the jobs because of NDAs and stuff like that, you know, not trying to get sued or anything. Okay. Um, but, uh, I worked a lot of different gigs behind the scenes in esports. Like okay. I was an admin for a lot of events. Oh yeah. I traveled mm -hmm. a bit. I did some observing, just a lot of stuff to help put, put on the show behind the scenes. Yeah. Can you talk at all? I know you said you have an NDA, but can you talk about, Maybe um, like let people know what admining is, like some of your responsibilities and ways that maybe somebody could get into admining. Yeah, admining is like being the babysitter at the daycare. You know, you see all the toddlers <laughs> running around, all the players, you know, doing silly things, making jokes in chat. I'm being facetious, of course, but you, you're the one that wrangles the players and makes sure the game is going to start when the director says start the game. So you're pretty much just making friends with people once again. This is kind of a, a string throughout my career. Um, you're just trying to get people to like you and to listen to you yep. and making sure that everything is running on schedule. Um, getting into admining, I think there's a website called Hitmarker. Um, I'm sure you've heard of it. I'm sure a lot no, of people have No, I actually have it. it. Interesting. Okay, so Hitmarker, I don't remember if it's .com or .gg. Okay. It's hard to say with esports. It is, But right. it's, it's a website where you can go and find job postings in esports. Um, and that's a great a great resource for admins that are looking for work. Um, now, if I'm not mistaken, I, I feel like the admins like a very entry level type position where they don't need a plethora of esports background. Is is that correct? 
Yeah, you're absolutely correct. As long as you can understand like the game lobby and how the game functions in terms of getting people into the lobby and getting the match started and being able to set the correct rule set, you can do it for almost any game. The skills carry over for game after game after game. One of the things that when I was shoutcasting for different groups that I worked a lot with the admin was, you know, I they were saying, okay, you know, Indrid, you, you're casting X game, you know, in team A and B are playing. It was my admin's job to often find team A, find team B, usually the captains. They usually spoke to the captains and said, hey, like, you need to get into this game. Go. Like, yes. we're, we're waiting. And, um, I kind of think of them like um, I don't even know what you would call it, but like you know in the movies when you see the person behind stage and they got the headset on and the clipboard oh, and they're yes. like the producer. Is that what it is? Is the producer? Yeah, uh, in movies when the person like has the clipboard and the headphones, that's like the producer. Yeah, but it's very similar in esports. Yeah, I feel like they're like shuttling, like okay, it's your turn, go, go, go. You like you need to move. Yeah, go, Celine Dion, get on stage. It's your turn now. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like exactly. the exact same thing. And um, so, what was it? Was it Hitmark GG or Hitmark.com? Hitmarker. Hitmarker. Yeah, I mean that's that's a great way to start. Like that's again great entry level. That's pretty sweet. I wish I, I w- uh, would have known about that. Um, yeah, es- esports is not nearly as difficult to get into as you may think. Yeah. Now finding your place in it might take some time, whether you're an admin or an observer or anything along those lines. But if you look online, you will likely be able to find something entry level. Would you consider an observer entry level also? No. Okay. I would consider that maybe one or two steps above, but it it definitely requires a lot more knowledge of the game. Right. Because you got to know where to be as you're observing. Exactly. If your director says, get onto this person or get onto this location, you got to be able to do it ASAP. So it's a bit harder. One of the things that really grinds my gears is games that don't have fluid ways to move between characters. I'm trying to remember what game it was that I played recently, and I was trying to learn the Observer, and it was, uh, I can't remember if it was 4v4 or 5v5, doesn't matter, but it was basically like 1, 2, 3, 4 were the, you know, the red team, and then yes. uh, like 6, 7, 8, 9, or whatever it is, sorry, you know, my numbers might be wrong, is the blue team. But then when somebody died, it shifted everybody. Oh. And I was like, why would you do that? Like you're <laughs> you're making it so hard to know like who's who. And and it wasn't like the one became a like just a dead button. It was like if a couple people died, one, two, and three were the same person. And then you had to like find the other person. Oh, it was driving me crazy, man. I was getting so frustrated. Yeah, as someone who's done observing, you're like reciting my worst nightmare. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> if, to constantly figure out what player went where and stuff like that would be no fun. Because I, I honestly do feel like the observing factor of the game is an afterthought, which really, if you're going to yes. develop a good eSport, you have to be able to function as an observer and be able, because again, it comes back to that storytelling. And if you don't have a good system for people to tell the story, it's going to falter. Absolutely. If you can't figure out how to get to the player that's slaying out the rest of the the lobby and you can't be like, how cool is this guy? Then it's not going to look great uh, for an or for somebody watching the tournament. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree. So little, little uh, thing nugget there for anybody who is listening that makes observers, please make it easy to navigate. (laughs) Game dev, please put go- good observer clients into your games. Yeah. I, I remember I told this story, I think, with Gilly, where I was watching a, a developer use this observer tool while I, I was shoutcasting at G-Star. And the way he, like, spiraled out of this, like, he unlocked from the first person, spiraled out so he could catch the broad, uh, you know, they're going, like, into a bomb site, and then came back into a person so he could get that angle. I was just like, while casting just absolutely blown away so i i i really think the observer is like the unsung hero of the like i I feel like the commentators get all the glory yeah i couldn't agree with you more like a football analogy i would have is you know they call receivers and running backs the talent positions but no one ever shouts out the center that handled two dudes on his own and made that running play possible right the observer is the person blocking those two people trying to tackle the running back. They're the one that like makes sure everything happens without a hitch. Yeah. I mean, seriously, it's such a great 
an underappreciated position. Yeah, every time you tee tours an observer on Twitch, think about the times they did good things too that you didn't say anything because you didn't even notice it was good. Yeah, it's one of those things where a good a good observer you don't notice, but when they goof it up, it's like rage inducing. Yeah, and that feels so bad for the observer. I can tell you firsthand mm-hmm. when you know you made a mistake and you're sending out a feed to a stream of anywhere from 500 to like 50,000 people, the feeling in your stomach is so bad. You just can feel the amounts of like people in chat going, what the heck, what just happened? Yep. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. Uh, the unsung heroes out there, guys, we love you, observers. Yeah, shout outs to you, observers. You own. <laughs> okay, so you, you said you talk, you did a little bit of admin, a little bit of observer um, and stuff um after battle right was there anything else because like right now i'm thinking about what you're currently doing as a live director and to me it it seems like a pretty natural like trajectory up a a pretty natural arc am i missing anything in that arc to get you to where you're at uh yes after i did some of the admin slash observer work i weaseled my way into an observer director position which was my first time actually having control of the stream and what was happening basically just you know stuff is happening on this in the game and you're telling your observers where to go um so that was my first taste of actual directing that kind of got me from observing to directing proper so you're basically shot calling the observers exactly okay interesting tell tell me a little bit about that like what what would be some inside secrets you learn from there that you know you you wish you could have known on day one the most important things that I learned from that were relating to people skills. Mm. I, I already tried to create a positive atmosphere within my team of observers, but I noticed every time that I would like encourage my observer or tell them, yo, I really liked that shot. Or if they made a mistake, oh, yo, it's okay. I saw what, you're, what you were trying to do with that. It, it would have been cool. You'll get it next time. Um, being able to positively reinforce what your teammates are doing and what they're feeling creatively um, impacts the project so much. And that can almost be like one of the most beneficial thing you can do. Dude, I love that. Yeah. I, I'm a, I'm a big believer in trying to like, you know, we talked about coaching a little bit. I can't remember if this was uh, on or before the podcast. So <laughs> I think it was a little before, but yeah. yeah. So um, like coaching's really close to my heart. And uh, like a lot of that is we, we talk about, um, like gauging risk so uh, like pushing people past the limit a little bit we're into like risk like oh man like i don't know if i should do that but there's this area where you're like oh i don't know if i should do that but i will yes and that like takes a lot of i think positive reinforcement and absolutely i'm all about that yeah one of my favorite things is even if the observer doesn't initially think of this option i'm like yo f it just try that Right. Do this thing that I just thought of because it sounds cool. And then it either works or it doesn't. But yep. giving people the agency to make a mistake and making sure they know it's okay and it doesn't impact like your thoughts on them like can help them lead to creating some really cool stuff. Man, you just hit like so deep. Like this is something I'm, – I'm 35 years old. And you just <laughs> hit something that I have been wrestling with hard for like the last two years. <laughs> and it's that idea of like mistakes aren't ending. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I didn't do something because I didn't want to do it wrong. Yeah, that fear is very heavy for a lot of people. Yeah, like that, man, that hit hard. This is, these are some of the things that I'm very, um, thankful for esports for because without playing on a team um which i highly recommend you should do if you like a game or without being an observer director i i think i would have taken so much longer to realize these things and i feel like i've matured a lot as a result of esports okay i'm going to use this opportunity to like step back a little bit because i said i wanted to highlight this but then i didn't work it in right so i'm just going to kind of jam it in now one of the things I love about your story is that you didn't go to college. And no. um, I feel like a lot of times our society says like college is the place to go for you to advance in life. College is the place for you to mature. College is the place for you to whatever. And I, so I have a master's degree in adult education in my thesis or my research mm. paper was on how video games make better leaders. Oh, that's dope. 
And so, um, so like hearing your story about how this did that for you, like, I really, really love that. And, um, like, I'm just going to kind of leave that open to you and like, talk about how, how you feel about that as like esports was your way to get this thing that most people say you have to go to college for. Yeah. You know, on why I didn't go to college, I just never really felt like it was for me. You know, Mm -hmm. I was 18 years old. I was being told I should go to college. I flirted with going to community college, but even then I didn't want to spend the money. Yeah. What it boiled down to for me was I didn't know what I wanted to do. Mm. And I didn't want to go in and spend a bunch of money on electives because that just doesn't make sense. If I decide I don't want to do anything that any of like my later classes channel into. So college just never made that much sense to me. Um, People tell you like you're going to make more money if you go to college and stuff like that. But I was always just more focused on doing what made me happy Mm. and college would not have made me happy. Even if I right now would have been sitting on like $200,000. I I think what I've where I'm at right now is irreplaceable. Yeah. Um, But yeah, being on a team and trying to live with a cool head and be productive, like very much gave me these skills I wouldn't have had otherwise. So I, I totally agree that gaming like definitely elevated me as a person i found the phrase you said there being productive very interesting because again this is something i've been wrestling with tell me more about what being productive means to you and what does that look like uh to me being productive it relates back to what i was talking about as an observer director where you're being positive with the people around you and encouraging them to do more and be better doing that kind of thing being productive in their life will also reflect that back onto you because you'll be living by those same things you're saying. Um, so I'm trying to find the right words to describe this, but really just always trying to find what you might be able to do better, even if it might be a mistake and then acting on it. Like for example, if you're playing a a competitive game and you think of this play that sounds super sick, but you, you know, it could backfire, like just going for it sometimes. Like just going for it in life, I think is really important. Um, there's a YouTuber slash Twitch streamer that I kind of like man crushing on right now named Devin okay. Nash. Have you ever heard of Devin Nash? Yes, I have. I've watched some of Devin's stuff. Yeah. So he recently was talking about this idea about the difference between motion and action. And actually, I don't know if it was recent because I've just kind of been grabbing his stuff. This could be an old video. But he was sure. talking a lot about how motion is like, I'm going to research like 10 people that I should invite on my podcast or I'm going to like think about topics that I should try to implement where so that's motion he's saying action is I'm going to invite 10 people I'm you know I'm going to move it forward in some way shape or form not just plan about my moving and that has got me thinking a lot about my own productivity yeah, I could definitely see where that would help you out, especially like with your podcast, like going from just thinking about who to invite, literally what you just said, to actually inviting people and getting show on the road, actually making a step towards what you want your end goal to be, even if you know you might get a bad guest. Yeah, or I mean, in reality, I think what ends up happening, especially with something so fledgling as this, is most people are like, no, it's not worth my time. And, mm. and that's just a reality of it, right? Like you have to grow an audience, you have to go forward. And, and so again, I'm very thankful for people like uh, you who come on and take the time. Of course, man. I love talking about esports. <laughs> um, so let's take this moment then. Um, it, we kind of highlighted that piece about college. That, that was something that was really dear to my heart. Sorry, guys, if that seemed like a little jarring, me making that jump. But I feel like it's important for people who have a passion for them to take action towards that passion and sometimes college isn't it but sometimes it is and yeah that's okay. and just as important as the ability to move on a passion and act on a passion is an ability to understand when it's not there which is why i didn't mm-hmm. go to college i didn't have any passion and i was kind of just like floating and i didn't want to go float in this space that would cost me twenty thousand dollars a month or a semester rather right um so it all for me it all comes down to just awareness and then being able to act on it when you feel passionate about a certain thing. Right. 
Mm, I like that. That that actually hit me hard on like a micro level. Um, mm. I've talked to my wife about this where like I feel obligated to do things socially that I don't want to do just because like I want to be nice or I want to be kind. And, and there's a time and place for doing something you don't want to do. Like that's yes. being a grown up. But yeah. Um, yeah. Balancing that has been really hard for me. Yeah, it's a hard thing to do. And I'm I'm up here sounding like I have it all down, but I'm still working <laughs> on these things, too. <laughs> We're all a work in progress. You know, it's it's OK. Yes, sir. Well, let's uh, let's transition here uh, and talk a little bit about what you're doing now as a live director. And could you tell us what is the difference between a live director and then being the uh, observer director? Right. OK, so there's a lot going on behind the camera of a tournament. Um, mm -hmm. There is an admin. There are observers. There are an observer director. There is a graphics operator. There's an audio engineer. Even the smallest 200 viewer shows can have like seven people working on them. If I may interject really quick, were we talking um, stream only uh, out of a studio, a LAN? Uh, how does that affect things and which are you referencing right now? Um, I'm more referencing smaller scale shows, not like the international or anything like that. Yep. Okay. Um, kind of just, you know, a regular tournament hosted by a company. Yep. Just want to get um, it in context for people who are thinking about you know getting into the space yeah sometimes i have a hard time with that just because i've been in it for a couple of years now so even when i try to explain it i still just <laughs> generalize things not a problem at I all should, I'll, I'll try to bring it back when i think of it great um gosh where was i so oh you, right there, yep. there are so many people behind the scenes the live director is the one making sure everything is happening at the right time making sure the observer or not the observer the director is getting oh my gosh the admin is getting the game set up making sure the graphics operator is ready to put on the proper image on screen and actually making the cuts the one that changes the things on the screen while coordinating everybody behind them to make sure everything is moving smoothly wow that's that i mean you're basically juggling like a hundred different things in the air yeah, you're just a professional juggler. <laughs> <laughs> so have you got the opportunity? Because I know this is a, a new thing for you. Have you gotten the opportunity to be the live director of, of anything? Yeah, I've been live directing with Wisdom for a couple months now. But okay. we just made it into a, a long time kind of, you know, I work for them situation. Okay, so um, you, maybe you're doing like a 1099 contract type of thing and it transitioned into more full time? Yep, that's it. Awesome. Yeah. Will you talk about that a little bit, too? Because I think that's something that people need to understand a little bit, too, with the with the gaming industry is that it's not always just about like getting hired by company A or getting hired by company B. And like sometimes you have to do contract work. And could you talk about some of the pros and cons for being contract? Yeah. Um, pro. So before I get into pros and cons, just the last thing you will do in esports is get a full time job. Mm. Once you've gotten there, that's when you're kind of like in the safe spot. Yeah. Contracting and freelancing uh, c composed most of my esports career, mm -hmm. um, so you got to be ready for that. Okay, I'm going to interject really quick. I loved when Gilly was talking about being on ESPN and thinking, "Ooh, I hope I have a job next week." <laughs> you know, dude, that's so true. <laughs> that like feeling is so weird and so uncomfortable, and that's by far the hardest thing I had to deal with in esports is mm. not knowing if I would have a job next week. Right. That I would put at the very top of the cons. Um, you, There's no job security. Even events that are going on for weeks at a time, like it could turn out that they don't think you're right for the position, which often happens, and it's not like anybody's fault, but rather just people trying to produce the best show, and if they think someone else is a better fit, then they're going to go with them. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean you're bad or anything, but you need to be prepared to be okay with not being the best. Mm. Um, which was very hard for me as somebody who is a competitive player of battle right mm -hmm. you know along with being a competitive player is wanting to be the best stuff like that yeah um so you're gonna have to be ready for competition there are going to be other people that want your jobs and there are going to be other people that are likely better at your jobs you're going to have to be comfortable with job security not really being there completely mm. um and those two things are really rough that's what i struggled with the most on the plus side you get to schedule yourself. 
if yeah. you decide you want a week off and you just made like six thousand dollars the last month you can just be like you know i'm just gonna chill <laughs> i don't want to go do that that gig this week yep um, i love the gig mentality yeah it's it's a blessing and a curse yep. it's both incredibly relaxing and very anxiety inducing yeah absolutely. it's an enigma um another thing that people really need to think about if you're freelancing you're going to have to do your own taxes oh it's not yeah as simple that's a great point a, a workplace filling out your taxes you're going to have to take out like a third of your day rate that day uh, a standard day rate in a in-studio position is around 250 300 dollars um i say that just because i don't want people being ripped off if mm. you're getting offered a job for a hundred dollars don't take it not worth it um but you're going to have to take a third of that and recognize it's for taxes. So if you made three hundred dollars, like you just have to kind of protect seventy five or a hundred. Yep. Yeah, I I think that's a really really good point to make. I I had a friend who got into a sales position for like, uh, what's uh man I can't think of it. Not Verizon. What's the yellow one that does phones? Sprint. Uh, Sprint. Thank you. He got into a sales position for Sprint where he was, like, traveling the world selling, um, like, package plans to corporations, not, uh, like, you know, just like a dude in there with a phone. And right, right. he was making, like, mad money. He And he was making, like, $9,000 a month, but he would only work, like, two and a half weeks a month. And That is incredible. But he didn't know that. He didn't realize he was 1099. And then tax season came and boy he got raked over the coals hard oh man and, yeah, he, that's really and rough. he wasn't prepared for it and so he yeah. had to take out debt to pay his taxes and then spent like years paying that back so like seriously this is something you do have to think about if you get contract jobs if you end up being 1099 that's often what they'll call it or doing freelance work i think those are probably like the three three big uh ways of describing that but yeah got to yeah. be ready for that Yes, you you if you aren't ready, like just know you have to either have the money on hand or be ready to pay a long term bill. Um, for example, my first year in esports, I didn't realize the severity of the tax situation, which is why I bring it up now, because I, I had to like live that, you know. Mm -hmm. So, for like the next year and a half, two years, I was paying like two hundred fifty dollars a month just trying to pay it off. So, yep. you can't get away from it. Taxes will cost a lot. Yeah, I think that's a great point to bring up. Um. So sorry to bring us back full circle. You've been live director then for a, a couple months, but now full time. Tell us what what like what did that mean for you being able to say that you have this full time position? Safety. Safety. That was like the number one thing. I don't have to go out and look for gigs. I don't have to worry if I'm not going to be able to pay rent. Mm -hmm. It was the the you made it moment. Mm. And now. I could still super mess up and lose my position. Yeah. But it, it's the first time in esports that I've been able to, you know, lean back in my chair and be like, it's okay. I have work. It's not going to change. I'm good at my job. I don't have to worry about a competitor taking it from me. Everything is okay. And how long of a journey was that for you from, uh, I think you kind of said you started around like 18, 19, you know, started playing competitively, started looking at other stuff. It, um, so how long was that for you to be able to say I made it? Yeah, it was about two years, one and a half, two years. I don't remember the exact date, but Battle Right Pro League season one, the end date was when it really like became hard for me or harder because you know, casters just make really good money. Like, for example, when I was casting, I would make like six, seven hundred dollars a day. Mm. Um, so you don't have to worry so much about not having a job because it's okay if you don't always have a job because mm -hmm. you know it, on a weekend you make over a thousand dollars um but after that when money became harder to come by and gigs became more important that's when it started getting really like rough and kind of scary and that's when i would like start the i need to get somewhere i need a kind of job period of esports mm. Yeah, what was it for you that got you through those rough periods? Because uh, I think about my time in esports and my time trying to like build YouTube and different things. Like I definitely like have peaks and then have super lows, and then I've had peaks and then super lows. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, it was always just I will regret this if I'm forty or if I'm forty and I back out. Mm. 
when I made the decision to move down from Seattle to California for esports, I I just did it based on the fact of I'm going to regret this if I don't. You got to know when to take your shot. You got to be aware of what you're going to think about your decisions after you make them. And you got to just try to do what you think will make you the happiest in the future. Right. And I just always remembered I'm capable of this. I can do this. I just need to keep trying and I can't give up because I will be so unhappy if I end up 40 back in retail. What was your friends and family response to you doing that? Um, they were all really excited for me. I've been very lucky. I've had, uh, once I started making a little bit of money as a competitor, my mom kind of like came around to it. She was like, oh, okay, there's actually money. You know, the classic like boomer video games, no money yeah. type thing. Yeah. Um, so she was, she was okay with it. Um, my friends, of course, they said they were going to miss me and stuff like that, but none of them said anything remotely bad. And I was just honestly, I don't like to use this word, but I was really blessed by those around me. Like everybody was super great. Yeah, I um, when I so I got hired by IPL. Uh, I don't know if you remember IPL. IGN had their own tournaments that they were running for a while, uh, specifically around StarCraft, League of Legends. They had some other small games that they were working in, and so I got hired to do that. And I came home, and I'm probably 28, 29 at this at this moment. Okay. And um, I didn't make a lot of money for that weekend, but I made some money. And my mom said to me. I, I probably one of my biggest mistakes was not encouraging you to follow your passion in video games. Dang. And, you know, I think I'm a bit older than you. I, I said I'm 35. You know, you don't have to disclose how old you are, but I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm a bit 26. older than you. Okay, yeah, so almost a decade. And so, um, yeah, like I remember pre-YouTube, I remember like it coming out and being like, man, is this something, you know, I should get into? Um, I remember playing games and my parents just being like, this is a complete waste of time. What are you doing? Right, right. So, a, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was gonna say, so I, I was going to say, so I love hearing that you had that support there. Yeah, I, I was very lucky, like I said. Um, and an interesting note you just reminded me that I want to touch on real quick is I didn't have a PC until I was 19. Oh, wow. So, I never played computer games other than RuneScape, which, I mean, you could play on a toaster. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. Shout out to old school RuneScape, though. Love that game. Um, but I never had a computer. I never played computer games until I played Dota 2 in 2014, 2015. Mm. Um, so relative to a lot of people in esports, I, I'm a young boy. I am fresh to the scene. Um, and I don't bring this up to brag, but rather just because you got to something later than everybody else, if you have passion, you should absolutely follow it. Man, you need to be an in inspirational speaker or something on the side. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. I mean, because it, it really is. And that's something I'm learning a lot about. Um, like, I, I feel like humans, I don't want to overgeneralize, but I feel like humans deep down feel good when they create. And yeah. not that all of us create in the exact same way. But when you find that thing that brings you joy when you create, man, you got to chase that. Absolutely. Like once you just catch, uh, I wish I had a word for this feeling, but there's a certain feeling I get when I'm casting or I'm competing or I'm directing that requires 100% of my focus and I don't mind. I love it. Mm. Once you find that feeling, that's your thing. Go, 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 go. Yeah, that's interesting. Um Man, when I think about that for me, it's been crisis intervention when I think about my past. Yeah, like, um, not trying to, like, be weird or, like, toot my own horn or anything, but, um, like, I've out of the blue been uh, approached by people, because I used to work at university, and okay. of, like, hey, this person's thinking about killing themselves, and I have to, like, go into game mode now. Oh, gosh. And, like, you know, like, they get 100% of my attention, uh, attention, and that feeling of when you're done, like absolutely exhausted, but like, whoa, I like, I can't, it's been 12 hours. It, it's it felt yeah. like 12 minutes. It's weird to say, but like, it, it's weird to say in reference to what you're talking about with crisis intervention, but we're both so lucky to have been able to find that thing that does that for us. Yeah. I, I feel that so many people go their life without feeling a lot of passion and just kind of like, go through the motions at least this is what i imagine I, I don't know everybody of course um 
but I, I bring this up because it's even more important to follow that thing once you find it. That thing is not common, and most people don't find it. So if you find passion, if you find excitement, if you find yourself wanting to be involved but having to dedicate so much of your mental energy, do it. I wonder if – this is getting a little off topic, sorry. But I wonder if oh, some great. of that is because it gets stifled out of people. You know, they're not yeah, encouraged like, you know, enough or – you got to be a doctor kind of thing. Yeah, or it's like, hey, I found this thing. No, like you got to go do this. And you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, that'd be interesting to talk more. I think about like Dr. K right now. I don't know if you follow – like he's blowing up. Yeah, um, I've, I've heard of him but not watched any of his content. Yeah, I've watched a little bit here and there. Some of it I feel like is amazing and some I'm like, yeah, it's not for me. But uh, sure. it'd be interesting to talk to him about it. I, I think that'd be a good good topic. Yeah, I'm trying to like really reflect because, of course, when I was a kid, I would play games. And as every kid that play games does, like I want to work on games when I grow up. Mm. Not that that means anything when you're seven years old. Yep. But there are definitely times where I've been stifled, been like, that's not a thing that doesn't happen. Um, but I'm wondering if there's a threshold on like the degree to which you need to be stifled to like not follow that passion. Hmm. I don't know. That's probably not even a thing. I'm just thinking. Well, out no, loud. because there's a lot of people who say, and I, I think this is kind of what you're getting at. There's a lot of people who said when they told me I couldn't do it, it made me have to do it. Interesting. You know, I don't know if you ever heard that. Like, I feel like a lot of, um, yeah. like, I don't know if Mark Cuban has said it, but I feel like somebody on like the shark tank, you know, they talk about when someone says I can't, that means I have to go do it now. And Interesting. so I, it, it's weird. Now I'm just trying to, th you know, talk out loud is the idea that sometimes that stifling, encourages people but sometimes it kills them do you, yeah is that just a personality thing then yeah the... i have no idea yeah i wish i were smart that'd be super cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah i just you know people are complex it's hard yeah the brain is hard yeah exactly back to dr k dr k come on the podcast let's chat yeah what, what's up dude let's talk about this <laughs> <laughs> oh man okay so back to being a uh, live director what would you say has been your like favorite moment of doing it? Uh, it sounds corny, but my favorite moment is when I've gotten the people around me to a point where they can take a risk and they do something that I didn't think of. Mm. And pardon me if I can I swear is that yeah cool? absolutely yeah yeah. So if I'm like watching an observer and I've like told them they can do these things and then they try something I never would have thought of and I'm just like bro that was fucking sick like <laughs> that moment like brings me like to nirvana i'm yeah. so happy that somebody felt comfortable enough to take a risk and it turned out well and it bettered the broadcast like that that's just so big for me um uh, that's a big like i feel like we share this in common from what i've heard from you is like a big thing for me is like i really love developing people and like yes it, and and so i was hearing that a lot from you where it seems like a lot of what pushes you is other people getting better Yes. Uh, when I was in high school, the only job that I or the only teaching. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, you went a little robo there for a second. Can you, you said the only and then cut out. Uh, yes. It, do I sound okay now? Yep. Now you're back. You're good. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. When I was in high school, the only thing I could like remotely see myself going to college for was teaching. Oh, okay. Um, and I think that's just like relating back to what we're talking about. And that's just a part of my character. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where do you think you learned that from? I don't know, honestly. Uh, it's really hard to say. I, I think the first option is definitely my parents. Um, my mom grew up or when I was growing up, my mom had multiple sclerosis, so she oh, couldn't really mm -hmm. walk well, mm -hmm. um, if at all. So I had to spend a lot of my time when we were, when I wasn't in school, like helping my mom with stuff. Mm. Um, it'd be that just like walking to the car or helping her get water or something. Uh, and I think from a young age that trained me to be attentive to other people's needs. Um, and that's probably just part of what led me to feeling happy when other people get their needs met. And then as an extension of that, they're able to do good things. Yeah. Yeah, that's, does that make sense? It does absolutely. I, I'm just like, I don't know how to what to or how or what to say to that story because I love it so much, and like I feel like any words I would give it would be dismissive of how I'm <laughs> feeling. Um, Thanks, man. That's really kind of you. 
no it's just like to me that is just so cool i we talked about again about this i think a little bit off stream i can't remember if it was off or on is that games have become so like in, enraging or tilting like a, a lot of people yes. have negative views of games and i just really want people to have a good gaming experience and find a place where they can where they can fail where they can be themselves where you know they can like grow and expand who they are as a person and you know i just don't feel like there's a it's hard because i feel like you know you're taking like a a cup out of the ocean sometimes when you're trying to be that person I, i think a lot of people when they're gaming um if they're not one of the people that's raging and they're like one of the people that wants to have fun and like relax and you know grow together uh, I think a lot of people pigeonhole themselves to one group of friends. Uh, mm. I think people encounter the first people they encounter, and they're like, all right, this is my group. I'm never leaving this Discord channel. Um, and for me, I, I've always tried to surround myself with the people who I thought fit me best. Um, so I would, I, I have no fear in like just leaving and like finding a new group of friends. And like, it's nothing personal, but I just want something. I want what's best for myself, and I want to find like, you know, what's the best fit for my personality. Um, So I feel it's really important that people take a step back. And if they're around a group of gamers that are incredibly toxic and you don't like that one, you can tell them that's not okay. Like if they're spamming the N word in chat, you can be like, yo dude, what's wrong with you? Right. Um, And two, you can, there are more people out there just like people say to like a boy that's just broken up with a girl. Like there are other fish in the sea. Like you can find a positive group if you just look right yeah i man i love it this this conversation has been so uplifting for me so i I really appreciate (laughs) it of course i'm glad i could do something positive (laughs) oh man it's been great um so uh to bring it back to what you're doing now again sorry i like i feel like i keep distracting us and it's all me no it's great i'm having a blast (laughs) okay good i appreciate that yeah no it's great um so with the live director there's a couple things that I, i was thinking about in I don't want this to like get you in trouble with your work. So if you feel like this is a weird question, you know, please oh, say so is what, what would be the next step? Like now that you're in this position, like where are you looking? Where would be your, your growth position? It's so funny that you say you don't want to get me in trouble, but this is actually one of the biggest points that I'm happy with about wisdom. Um, I don't see myself being a live director forever. I absolutely adore this gig and I wouldn't change it for anything right now but who knows what I'm going to want in 10 years. Right. Um, And I've been given the freedom to tell my boss, I want to do something different. And that's just, it's a weight off my shoulder to know Mm -hmm. that like I'm around people that truly want me to like do what I want to do and want me to be my best me um, to rip off some Instagram posts. (laughs) Um, But I think from here where I go, is I, I want to transition into a project manager role like after five, 10 years. Okay. Um, because I think it makes the most sense. And I think it would also be a lot of fun because mm. when you, a, a project manager role is just the person that, you know, sets up the gig. Yeah. Make sure that everything happens the way it's supposed to. And I think I could get the same fulfillment out of enabling my team in that. And I think it also is just natural because I've done so many different things in the esports scene. You know, I've commentated, mm. I've been an admin, I've been a live director, I've been an observer, I've been an observer director. The only thing I haven't really done a lot of is either replay or audio mixing. Um, but I, I think it's only natural that I move into a position that requires you to build this group of all these different positions. So as a, as a project manager, I'm trying to put it in context of, um, like when I think of a project manager at my work, their role is they they have an objective whatever that objective is yes and then they have to meet with the team that will complete that objective for the business yes and is that basically falling in line exactly what you're talking about yeah and a lot of it what i've seen in esports is also composing that team and working with people that also are with the clients and making sure things are working but still like in your company um, and building with them, like the, the group of people that gets the job done, you know, the A team that you send in. Mm-hmm. Um, and then yeah. you will be the liaison then to, um, the, the like customer facing side of things. Is that correct? Like you'd be customer facing. Yes. 
Okay. And it, it's funny. Back when I worked in retail before I got into esports, which also that that transition is not crazy. You can do it too if you're listening and you work in retail. <laughs> um, one of my favorite things, which a lot of people seem to hate, was working with customers and being like, "Yo, how's your day? I like your shoes. Did you find everything okay?" Like I, I just enjoyed talking to people in a situation where it's kind of like manufactured to be positive in a way. Yeah. Um, I just like engaging in that kind of atmosphere. I'm um, so 100% think, the same way. Yeah. It's just, I don't know why. It's just fun, you know? For me, uh, it's because people always have such a negative expectation for it that when you make it genuine, it's palpable. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that. Um, But I, I think that just transfers over well into being client facing. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I think we've kind of heard the gamut of your story of how you started, you know, you, you dodged college in a way that I think is awesome. And again, it's coming from somebody who used to work in universities. You, you, you chased your passion and basically, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to be derogatory when I say this, but like you just hustled your way up the ladder (laughs) and you know, I love that. Like I love the hustle and Worked as an admin, worked as uh, an observer, did some observer directing, did some shoutcasting. Uh, I just think that's awesome. And I'm assuming with your shoutcasting, too, you did a little bit of, like, being the booth guy, too? Or what do you call it? Like the... Yeah, the uh, analyst. Yeah, like the analyst and the guy that yeah. isn't doing the actual game but filling in the air between games. and. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, just an absolute wealth of knowledge, I think, from you and, and wealth of experience so i mean this is just a gr- to me this is one of the most um clear and i think replicable is that the word uh yeah, road I path word for it. or road path road map i think for somebody who's interested in getting in and yeah so i i super love your story i really appreciate you sharing it w- with us and I know I learned a lot and I feel like I learned a lot and I already saw behind the curtain a little bit. So I'm excited to hear what, you know, other people have learned. Um, but as always, I leave the end of the podcast to you. So viewers, thank you very much for checking this out. Please be sure to share and check out, uh, Joseph Meacham. Yeah, you got it. And, uh, his Twitter is there at, at in the flesh 93. So be sure to check him out. And uh, I really appreciate it. You have the last words. Yeah, uh, there are two things that I didn't mention that you just sparked in my mind. Uh, And before I go, I just want to say, I am not special. You can do this too. If you like esports and you want to find your way into it, you will. Hitmarker.gg, hitmarker.com, find a position. Also, when you're working these gigs as a freelancer, the most important thing I can say is be curious. Ask questions. Ask what the other groups of people are doing. And always let people know that you're interested in learning and you're interested in doing these things. It's very important. Um, Indrid, thank you so much for having me on the show. I've had an absolute blast. He already shouted out my Twitter. Uh, if you haven't followed Indrid, I'd follow this guy. Pretty cool dude. Even talking to him before the show, I've, I've really enjoyed my time. 